talk about uh, to us about culture hacking. That's it for me. Uh, yeah, culture and happiness. The University of Sydney. All right. So just to understand the audience a bit, um, how many of you guys are 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 you all coaches here or, or developers here? What's who's in the who's the program so? Okay. And and who's the coach? Okay. Cool. Great. And who's in in the business? Yeah, we're all in business. <laughs> okay. So um, yes, yeah, so my uh, uh, career went. I started with computer science. Was programming initially, but uh, eventually started the servicelife.com in 2000. Sort of uh, discovered a little niche as a sort of technical journalist on, with that website. And I didn't own it, but I created it and managed it. And then eventually it got sold and sold again. And then eventually it got bought by a big bad evil media company called Pixaria. And uh, stayed there for a year, but was sold, brought it, and I quit, started Secret Media, which does infoq.com and also Qcon. And uh, so, so, how many people here are familiar with? Okay. Those who aren't, uh, it's, it's not key to the, to the talk. It's, it just, uh, it's a news website for the software development community. And we have well, almost, last month we almost touched 800,000 unique visitors to our, our biggest month. And uh, we also build news articles and posts online. Very big and agile. We have the most agile content on, on online. And also QCon is a, is a in, in person conference from the seven cities. I guess I'll talk about that in a moment. But so I, I guess the, my point for all that was that I moved, I'm no longer really a programmer, I'm, I'm a CEO, and I'm a CEO that's in love with culture and, and high performance teams. So maybe you're hearing things from a different uh, perspective. I hope this talk is helpful. It's, it's really about how I manage the teams, um, well, the company, it, but it's about the culture side of it. So, <laughs> so what is the culture? I, I got this uh, gem of wisdom at a dance conference last year. Uh, someone said, I don't know who said this, but it just, just really stuck with me. It's the emotional feeling you get working there. Um, it just blows my mind. It's so simple. It just makes so much sense. So as CEO, I'm really concerned with what are what is people's emotional experience working somewhere. And I'm sure you guys are too. And that's why you're here. So I'm sure all of you already know this, but the culture can be consciously designed. It can also be unconsciously designed, mm -hmm. for better or for worse. And uh, but I think you're, you're all here because you want to learn how to consciously design it. Um, so I I mean. I, I tried to organize this talk in the context of this framework. Um, Dan Pink, who's written the book Drive, who's, who's heard of this? Okay, so um, it's also, this was at one point the top, top TED talk, like most views, it's five minutes, and uh, it's about what really creates uh, team motivation. So he argues that once, once salary is considered fair, money is actually not the major motivator. What it is, is the sense of purpose, autonomy, and mastery. So I've organized this talk in terms of how I've, designed, I've consciously designed uh, my company to create this feeling in, in employees. Uh, because, uh, well, for many reasons, obviously motivation. But also because, uh, even for me personally, life right now, I get some, my sense of fulfillment comes more from, from this than from, than from revenues and seeing increases. Of course, that has to happen, but that's more an indicator of, of a good running team and a good vision and all that. And uh, so, so I'm going to be repetitive. A lot of things we do serve all three purposes, but I try to segment it into sections by, by, by these three, by this framework. So apologies if it's a, if it's a, if it's a bit disorganized. Another thing that'll come up again and again is, is this framework. So this book changed my life. Um, it helped me move from a developer trying to, to be a CEO to actually learning how to pass and manage a business. This, kind of, this book is very big in business circles. It's basically all the tactics you need to run a fast growth company or a team or really any organization that doesn't have to be a company. And um, so a lot of the, the topics here I'll be uh, repeating a number of times throughout the talk. Uh, so I'll already introduce myself. Uh, so as CEO, I, I come to see my role as something like this. And I, I like to get this message out more so other CEOs see themselves in the same way. So what does CEO mean? And I see it now as community experience officer. So there's many communities that I have to serve. There's obviously the employee community, which is number one. So what is their experience of being here? Bringing you know, conscious design to that. What does it feel like for them to, to work in a company? Uh, but the community includes anyone that, that doesn't delivers any services. The employees, our, our editors, sp speakers at our conferences, um, suppliers, anyone. Uh, our customer community, of course. I, mean, I think obviously most CEOs are, are geared on that only. But I think it, someone should see that their role is, is expanding all these communities. 
and then, and then the investor community. I think this might be reversed for a lot of other studios, but this is the order that I, I can serve them in. And, um, and of course, if you focus on any one more than the others, then things will suffer. I think you have to have a holistic view across uh, all three. And this is probably true for any leader, right? You can substitute CEO with anything. And uh, it's, I would say it's true for any, any leader. Um, so I see my role as being to align our strategy to our purpose, to make sure people know our purpose. Um, Serve leadership. Again, that, that was a big difficult thing, transitioning from a small business to medium size, which is going beyond sort of these with thousand offers to, to a servant leader, which is, um, um, it was difficult and painful, but, but then eventually got that book and things started to change, and I was just really needing to, to find a, a different way of doing things. Um, and on a, on a personal level, it was also personally much more gratifying. Because, uh, that when I was trying to run a medium sized business based on all the um, stereotypes that I learned about CEOs growing up, you know, my senior opinion parents were like, you know, just, you know, it's bad news when it comes to a team that ends. Um, it was just like not a, it wasn't really a fulfilling experience. I mean, just, um, I mean, this stuff, being a servant leader, is not only needed, it's also more fulfilling in terms of running a large business, uh, unless you're Steve Jobs. <laughs> but I think he found a way to maybe incorporate a bit of that too. Uh, you have a question, Jury? Oh, Jury, because this is really a circle, so I'm not thinking about a bunch of standards, so let's please stop and ask questions anytime. Uh, can, can you walk us through what makes a servant? Chinese version, uh, which is all, all translated plus original content, 
New England version, and we have also, uh, and those are internal teams that are part of C3 Dev. We have a franchise in Japan and in France. Uh, NFP France is launching tomorrow. And, uh, and so we're sort of repeating this model in all these other places. So, uh, and then of course we have QCONs. QCON New York is this week. It's our second year in New York, and uh, we've been in London, San Francisco for six years. And we're sort of all over the world. Wherever there's, for example, Q, there's, there's QCON. So we've sort of become like the go-to conference for TDs and architects and uh, more software journalists in, in all these regions. So the full-time team, again, this, this talk is not just about software development. It's really about the company, but a lot of these concepts translate. So we have 29 staff members across six countries and 150 editors worldwide. And it's really remarkable. Like, how do these people have anything in common? How do we work together? How do they feel a sense of belonging? That's what they're going to be talking about. And especially when they all work from home. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, as, as an introvert, it's great to be the CEO of a virtual company that's very culture driven because you communicate all the time, but these structures will actually make people feel good, but you don't want to be that social. It's great. So, so I mentioned earlier that everybody has to talk in terms of purpose, autonomy, mastery. So, this is our purpose. Uh, and I'm, I'm talking to you now the way you, know, you might talk to your teams. So, you know, software is changing the world. I mean, no one can doubt that. I mean, the iPhone is changing all that. And Google Docs is changing everyone's lives. So, see, for me, this purpose is to facilitate the spread of knowledge and innovation and impress in software development. Um, there are many purposes around in many other companies that you may have heard of. Um, not many of these purposes are, are articulated clearly clearly by those companies externally, but they probably are internally. Um, th this came from Jim Collins' article, so I assume he knows what, what they're doing. And so, you know, this is our purpose. And and I talk about this a lot to the team. And, you know, when I talk about it, it, it also gave me a, a strong sense of why, uh, more motivation to do what I do. Um, uh, because, you know, once we, I guess sort of this is a, a stepping stone in an entrepreneur's life. Once the vision was realized, and it was, it was profitable, like, okay, well, now no, what am I here? I never really saw myself as, as, a, as a CEO. Like, I, I saw myself as being more of a startup guy, like, just doing things that are interesting. And, and um, I almost needed this for myself, just to, to have a sense of why for, for what I'm doing. Um, but it turns out that everyone does, because I mean, if a CEO needs it, an employee needs it even more, because what's, no, no one really wants to come to work to make money for someone else. They want to have a sense of, like, why am I here? But, so uh, this is really important to, to cultivate this. It's interesting, when we had this transformation about finding our purpose, and this came again from that Rockefeller I was book, and it turns out that I go to a lot, of, I go to a lot more entrepreneur conferences now on my own time than, than developers. I guess I only go to a few months. Uh, but at, at entrepreneur events, like, this is cool. Purpose and culture is sort of becoming cool among, among startups and like, and um, any business owners that are willing to listen. So it's, it's almost like now, in a startup community, it's not cool to run a company just to get rich. Because have to have a cultural <coughs> which is great, it's great for the world, right? But before we had our transformation, this is how we described InfoQ. You know, like we're an independent community, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it was just very typical, right? But this is how we describe it now. Like, we start with our purpose. You know, software is changing the world. And this is how we do it. And same with QCon. We used to describe it as we're an enterprise software conference, you know, it's time for this, blah, blah, blah. You know, we're the best at networking, all the other, the world's best at testing. So we're out to <laughs> and this is how we describe it now. You know, so software is changing the world. We need to empower software development by facilitating the spread of knowledge and innovation. So purpose is not something right on a piece of paper and forget about it. It's something that becomes part of how you explain yourself, how you think about what you do, um, the, the language in the company, the your marketing materials, everything. Because um, what a lot of a lot of I think even customers would rather work with the company where they feel this company is, is doing something in the world as opposed to just providing a service. Even if you just provide a service, if you have a purpose and it's understood, it, it sets you apart, um, both from a uh, uh, you know, customer perspective and an employee perspective. So <clears throat> using purpose to drive strategy. Um, so this is just sort of my opinion. In an old school business, and I've been in management meetings like this, like how can we make more profit exporter? So sort of the, the, the drive of profit drives the creativity. 
but I like to think that in a social business, which is sort of also a new up-and-coming, well, not really up-and-coming, but it's becoming the, the norm now in, uh, in entrepreneur circles, I like to think that ideas drive profit. So the, the thought process is, you know, given our purpose, which ideas are the most disruptive because we want to, to scale our purpose, we want to make an impact, and which of those ideas are the most profitable? It was also sort of a, a, a pivot point for me mentally is understanding that that there isn't a contradiction between profit and purpose. Um, you know, a lot of um, sort of leading thought leading CEOs in this area talk about people, profits, people, climate, profit. Uh, so I mean, in fact, you need a profit to scale a mission. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg said that a, uh, a company is a great way to align a group of people around a particular mission, and you need a profit to scale that. So that was, at least for me, that, that was sort of a, um, a shift. And there's a shift now occurring also in, again, in entrepreneur circles, sort of away from nonprofits towards sort of purpose driven or social business um, and, and not, not seeing any issue with that. Because really, what's, what's a nonprofit? Just a company where there's, there's no, no dividend being made, but people can still have high salaries. It's just, it's really not, not quite. Um, a company can be run just as noble, nobly, if I can make up that word, as a, as a nonprofit. Running from a strong um, cultural framework like this. So we communicate our purpose to the world in this way. We we launched a um, when we, we launched a redesign of Liverpool here recently. Uh, in the top header, there's a social purpose index link, which only had 50 like 50 bucks in a month, so we might take it down. Uh, but I wanted to have a sense of how we measure the impact of our purpose, and, and we we just thought maybe volume is maybe a bit lame, but it's what we came up with. So this there's ways to communicate your purpose, not just to the customers. Well, to the employees. I mean, when I share this, this this thread on our internal network, and I'm sure people feel good about it, it gives more meaning to people's jobs. Um, again, this is sort of a random smattering of everything we do to, to culture hack. Um, in the book, The Rockefeller Habits, actually the way I heard of it is I was sitting in a circle like this at an entrepreneur event, and someone mentioned in passing a one-page plan. Like, whoa, oh, one-page plan, that's great. Like, I, I need that. I don't have any plan. I don't even know if I have a plan. Once the vision was realized, well, how do we make a business plan? So this is a one-page plan. And part of the, um, the theory and the way this builds purpose is that everyone's supposed to have their own copy of it. Uh, I can actually show you a zoom, zoom in better version. This is a one-page plan from, uh, as taught by uh, Gazelles, which is the rock, master in the rock club out this guys. It has everything you need to know to run a company. So it has your purpose, your core values, um, has your, your three years, where do you want to be, uh, your key, key capabilities you need in three years to get to where you want to be. Um, what are your core competencies and what those are? Your big carry out agency school, your brand promises. These are things the business needs to understand to, to make decision making. This is your strategy. Three billion a month? Um, eventually. This is a 10 year thing. Big carry, it's a big carry out agency school, right? It's, it's not next to it. That's a lot. Yeah, I, we'll get there in 10 years. I'm sure. Later, almost a better way. Yeah. Um, it has your one year plan, uh, what needs to be one year, what are your targets, what are your top fives, so ideally you should only have five things, no more than that um, at a corporate level, because that's important. Critical numbers. Um, then the quarter, what's, what's top for the quarter, what are your targets, what are your top five uh, priorities for the quarter, what are the critical numbers for, for the quarter. Um, so it's sort of like a, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Like, it's, like, a, it's like a canvas that makes sure that, that leadership has thought all these things through. Create a framework for that. Do you uh, include your employees when you set these numbers, or is it just set by leadership? Yeah, so this is the reason why I brought this up in the purpose of context of purpose is that the fourth column is your accountability. So the idea is that everyone in the company has their fives and their numbers and has a copy of the whole plan. They print it up, put them on their desk, so everyone sees everything. So like, there's nothing that the employees see. Strategic so everything is everything. Yeah, the targets, profit numbers, it's not like a balance sheet, it's just like, just compile all the rules, right? Mm -hmm. But they see everything. And the theory is that you get line of sight. Um, this is my very expensive rock club habits coach, who costs uh, between three and five hundred dollars an hour. <laughs> he just has a, a lot of coaches here, so you guys might be inspired to go out coaching business instead. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the idea is that if everyone has a copy of this plan, and if their work here, they have line of sight, so they can they see how their work matched, is fitting into the company's strategy, and that, that creates purpose because you know why we're doing it.
Well, in, um, we're, we're 29 employees, but, but we're also separate geos. So my immediate team is, is only 15, uh, which, and I have two other GMs that report to me. So if, if they're well run and you have a good sort of reasonable hierarchy, hopefully the managers are tricking this down. How well are we now? Yeah. Um, well, we're still in progress in implementing all this, but the management team has this now, and, and I want to trickle it down. I need to come forward with it. I'm doing a lot of this. The only thing I haven't done yet is, is to actually give everyone a copy of this particular plan because we, we kind of like stepped a bit forward and made it the Blue Dog Sheep version of this, I'll show you soon. So I haven't sort of gone back and trying to do it the traditional way. But, but we have another version of this. It doesn't look exactly like it. Okay, we start two years ago we made the first version. Every quarter we look at it and the quarterly meeting is basically to, to make me on this and improve it. And uh, every quarter we, we make uh, we update this column, we have quarterly rocks that they fit the annual priorities every year. We, we update this one. Uh, we, of course we update it mid-year if there's a major shift that is we can predict maybe there isn't. Um, but yeah, let me correct myself before. Everyone has seen this, they have access to it, and, and they have seen a, a spreadsheet version. Um, they just haven't I haven't actually printed the, the domain on it yet. That's something I'll I want to do this quarter. Uh, but but our time is seen now, so everyone has they have the full copy of it. Well, I'll show you the spreadsheet first this uh, thing. Okay. Yeah. Is there a template of this one page kind of available somewhere without yeah. your actually it's great because the the um Gazal's guy he made the spreadsheet version, but the GM of my China unit actually spent two days making the Google Docs version. Spread, and we just released it back to everyone else. So the link is free. So Google Docs is the uh, version is free. Yeah, if you email me after, I'll, I'll share it back. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. Yeah. So if this is being pushed now, how does that promote the anonymous? Yeah, autonomy. And the other is how does this fit into Agile? Because like, as like a developer, my my goals are pretty much set by the by the business. Pushed down. Well, um, I mean, depends how it's executed, right? I mean, I I give everyone the company a chance to comment on what should our aim for the next year, what, what can we do better, you know, what, what's not not working well, um, and the fact that they all have a plan. And you see, like the, the bottom of the plan is your SWOT analysis, right? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities. So the, there's full alignment, and uh, so everyone has a chance to 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 make the suggestions. The management team gets together and comes up with the annual top fives, and then when it comes to the, the quarterly rocks. Um, those are usually involving a lot of um, uh, managers. We don't have that many levels in the company yet, but so, so when it comes to individual objectives, that's always trying to be bottom up. Basically, we say, here's the rocks, here's the rest of the plan. What do you think we should do? What do you want in the next quarter to, to get to take things ahead? So it's, it's, it's more like both. Um, and in an agile context, I guess it's a similar context to a, to a department, right? I mean, so. In Rockwell habits, they say different departments can have different versions of this plan. So the department would share the culture side, of course. But this uh, the three-year, one-year quarter, I would advise every department to have this redone. Also, because if you also know what you want to do in three years, one year, you can do a better job explaining to management why these things are strategic. You know, if you know what the company's targets will be a few years from now, and and you know that the, the dev team doesn't have certain capability for the car to get there. This framework will let you speak to your, your the CEO in a whole different way um, in explaining both three year, one year, and then quarterly. So yeah, so we're not big enough to need different departments of that of, of plans, but but it, I, the theory is that the companies will have departmental plans. Yeah. Okay. If that helps. I, I Especially when there is a quarterly objectives process, which I'll sh show a bit more about soon, um, there is just there's generally a line in the company of what it means to have an objective. So when someone suggests one, like people take it more seriously. It's not just like out of the blue saying, "I just want to do this." It's like, well, no, I think the top five for the dev team should include not just these business driving priorities.
stories, but this refractory curve too, because otherwise we won't get a lot of trouble later. So there's a language now, there's a, a domain language in the company about these things called objectives, and, and we all take it seriously when people make free suggestions. That helps. Other questions? Okay. Um, so yeah, so I mentioned purpose again because everyone that practiced this, and, uh, and, and as you said, departments can have their own version. So why not have your own manifesto? Why not have your own SWOT analysis for your, your department known to your, to your team? You know, why not have your own core values known to your team? So that this, this framework can apply at, at any level. You may not need the full complexity of this particular style. So next is autonomy. Um, and again, I will be repetitive, so a lot of what we do serves all three. Um, I'm sure you all know this, since most of your coaches, but I'm trying to create self-leadership in everyone, from the lowest possible level, you know, from, from the, the process manager we're hiring you know, uh, next week, which I'd like to give her the title process manager as opposed to coordinator, because she's managing a process, she does only she wanted. So, um, so my interpretation of this, <coughs> we want to create autonomy, but you also need some kind of structure, right? So um, we want to get here, everyone in a sense of self-leadership. So, if you are giving a lot of autonomy, but but there's no, there's basically no um, no structure. There's no leadership support that can create this engagement. It's like someone left by themselves. And that, that, that sucks. Um, if there's no autonomy, and there's you know also lots of you know, command and control, you all know what that means. But up here, if you have too much empowerment, but, but not enough autonomy, that's that's poor micromanagement. That's also poor low performance. That's also hypocrisy, right? You can't be so empowering. So to me, this means about the leader style. Is the leader being, um, it's sort of a scale between, and I should probably change the word empowerment and, and, and structure. Are we creating a, a supportive structure in which people can have autonomy and, and be self-directed? Um, this is sort of how I, I think about it. Because I didn't draw this actually, I just found it online, but this, this seems to really be advice. So would empowering mean actually giving somebody a problem to solve instead of uh, yeah, that would be empowering with a high degree of autonomy. So that would, that would be giving people self leadership. Okay, so what can you give us an example of something without an individual's autonomy? Mm -hmm. what, what's that low performance, uh, an example of that low performance? Well, boy, I think I can hop in here and help. Sure, yeah, sure. My, my experience of this is that the left side is about how much authorization the leader gives the other people. Where it says direct, it's very low. Where it says empowering, it's very high. Does that help? Authority, the right, the right to do work. That's what authority is. So if we have a very empowering manager, conveying a lot of right to do work, right? Very yeah, direct that's manager, very low right to do it. Okay, that's a good way to think about it. Makes sense? Yeah. How does that differ from autonomy? Yes. Well, if you, if, have you ever had responsibility without authority? <laughs> How does that make you feel? Right? I mean, you, 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 you're being charged to do something, but you don't have the tools to exercise. Right. Yeah, right. so that would be the, this upper corner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so thank you. Uh, the help. Yeah. So you can help. Sorry. Uh, but and also, basically, from a CEO's perspective, there's also different structure. The thing that's not clear here is what's the role of having a clear structure, um, uh, a clear framework in which people understand their, their authority, right? If the framework is clear, if, all, if all authority is clear, can play and have freedom within that space, right? So, so I also think that if um, if if someone has a lot of perceived autonomy, but, but the structure is unclear, that that also creates a lot of resentment. That creates a lot of upset. Um, but but if if, if if the leader sees his role, he creates a lot of structure. People understand what their role is. They understand their accountabilities. They understand the KPIs for the accountabilities. Then the leadership can step back and they can have full self self leadership. And that, that's important. So. So a lot of people, when they think structure, they think micromanagement, but I think not necessarily. I mean, there's, there's a way to define structure that can be empowering. Um, and I'm still learning that myself, so I can't really be more prescriptive than that. For me, the closest thing that's looked, that I found it looks like is, is really defining accountability. Um, and then defining what that means, and, and using metrics so people understand how to be successful with that accountability. 
So I, I much prefer actually, and our coaches have been really very recently talking about this too, is that don't give people job descriptions, give them a, give them a, a position profile that explains what they're accountable for and what their KPIs are. And that's it. So it's not a description of tasks and roles, it's a description of, of what, they, what they're supposed to care about and, and what success looks like. Uh, and that, that's actually, it's very liberating to, to think in that way. Both for them and, and for me, because I don't have to document how I'm using it. I have to document the, you know, the why and the why, and not the how. So how do we foster, this sort of speaks to what we were saying before, uh, how do we foster autonomy and empowerment? Um, well, we just talked about sort of being results oriented. Core values, I'm going to talk about um, quite a bit after this. Transparency and trust, meeting rhythms, using rhythms, meeting rhythms in the right way. Um, a, le a learning or organizational mindset. So I'll talk about these sort of table contents for what I'm about to talk about. So, so what are our core values? Um, actually, before I go there, how many work in an environment where there are clearly understood core values right now? Stated, really understood. Okay, so some. And, um, you know, this is, it, it's amazing how practical this is. Well, when you first hear about values, it sounds so fluffy, but it's such a practical tool. It's just, I wish everyone just uh, just knew it. It's, and actually our business coach who talks to a lot of businesses says this is one of the most underutilized business tools. So uh, these are our core values, so transparency. And this is how I explain it to our staff. You know, be transparent about process, status, or feelings, success, and failures, um, integrity, math, and transparency, especially in a virtual company, I think is probably one of the most important. Um, integrity, mastery, you know, we never stop learning. We strive to continually improve. Service, the, the joy of serving others, to go above and beyond for our customers. Um, you know, accountability, we take ownership for our results. So this is, again, this could just be a piece of paper that you never look at again, but I want to talk to you about how we make it alive and how you can make it alive. Because this is really, um, this, is, this comes to the core of culture hacking, I think, is, is creating culture and how do you define your culture, your core values is one of the ways you define your culture. So this is one of the ways, the tools we use to define our culture. So we internally we use Yammer. How many here are, are, are not using Yammer? I'm just trying to get more heads up. So Yammer is like, <laughs> Yammer is like the, the, it is like the foundation of our culture in a virtual company. It is so important. Um, maybe maybe 10 years ago, the equivalent of Yammer would have been everyone being in one IRC channel. But that's a bit invasive because you're, you're forced to be there, and that, that's also a bit, a, bit, a bit invasive. I'm not comfortable with that. Yammer is like private Facebook. It's Facebook, Twitter mixed in a private corporate setting. So we Yammer, I, I, as CEO, I set the base example. I Yammer lots of things. I Yammer you know, interesting ideas, you know, status updates, like short things like tweet stuff. Um, I Yammer um, acknowledgments of others. Post pictures of their dogs and you know, make everyone comments on it. I mean, I just want to demo this to you because it's, it's, it's so great. Uh, I think everyone should read since their team. So, this is our buy the Yammer page. So, you know, Nit was talking about a sponsorship that just went live. We have 504 opt ins. This is, of course, uh, confidential. This is a picture of, uh, uh, you know, our team's exhausted. This was from last night. And people are liking it from all over the world. Um, just stuff like this. Like, Kevin from China is posting a picture of his trip to the Great Wall. So it's a mix of business and, and, and personal, all in one space. Um, you know, quotes, um, all kinds of things. So you see, we'll have a post, and you have someone from like five different countries liking it. And it creates an emotional feeling for the person posting it when it gets likes from five countries in the comments. So this is, we're only 30 people in the company. And uh, in a sense, when they come to the office in the morning, they're on the computer, even though they're in their home, this just creates that emotional sense that we're, we're, I'm part of something bigger. This is, this is a, a team I'm part of. How, how could you create that without a tool like this? So this is, this is just so, so critical to have Yammer. And uh, one of the ways that I, I, I made Yammer fun and, and accessible, I got to repeat myself so many times. I said, Yammer is not about status reporting. I mean, it is good to post what you're up to there because when you do that, and I'm speaking to you now as if you're on our team, so just giving me talking points. Um, when you post on Yammer, you're creating a sense of buzz for others, that you're feeling that things are going on. Um, even when you post one day, things that you do, it just creates a sense of progress. People feel these things happening. They feel included. They feel like they're, you know, like when you post something, you're, you're, you're contributing to others' experience. Your, your culture happens. Um, also, we're, 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 we're spawning conversations. A lot of discussions across teams happen that would never happen otherwise. A lot of ideas are being exchanged. Um, 
And to make it fun, I have a policy that, that Yammer is read optional, but, but if you don't read it, you'll, you know, it's read optional in that you should never worry about getting um, instructions or tasks or any kind of um, critical things through it. Those have to go through Yammer. Yammer is, is for just fun and information sharing. So I say it's read optional, but I want everyone to be reading and beyond it. Have, have fun with it. But they shouldn't take, come to a mindful mind of stress because this is a place where you're going to get work. And just recently, actually, um, in China, they, they, there's this app called WeChat, which is like a, a group messaging app on the phone. You have some voice messages too. And the GM of our China unit was, was also passing tasks through it. And I said, you probably shouldn't do that because you're going to create more stress for people. Nobody wants to get work after 6 p.m. on their phone. You know, love that through email, but use WeChat because people love WeChat. It's huge in China. It's like Facebook on your mobile phone. Like, use it for fun, but don't use it for, for those kinds of tasks, delegated tasks. So, I was mentioning core values, so we have a, um, a core values tag. And, and, and the way that I make our core values alive, one of the ways, is by I created a culture and I set an example by which you can acknowledge someone else. You say thank you to them by acknowledging which core value they, core value they embody when they did something. So here's Ruby from China thanking Sai from China for sharing a book review on the Euro technique, core values mastery. Of course, it's, it's about self improvement, right? So, so the, the rule is, um, acknowledge someone, say what they did, and which core value applies. And it's so active. We have like like 30, 30 50 acknowledgements almost every, every three, four months. It's, like, it's so vibrant. It's such an online culture that people from the bottom up are acknowledging the core values. Um, <laughs> this is a funny one. Kevin changed my life. He told me how to link, link a, a word in a Google spreadsheet to a URL. So, and, and little things like that. But, but this creates a sense of um, belonging, a sense of um, obviously gratification on the, on the those that are being things, and it, it reinforces to everyone else that this is cool. Like, what are core, what are core values? They're the shoulds or shouldn'ts in, in, a, in a team. They're not beliefs. They're not like, you know, we believe in, in ABC. It's like, they're, they're like, this is the behaviors that constitute um, who we are, the feeling that, you know, just how we act. So that's, that's an unmistakable thing. When you make your core values your belief system, um, it becomes righteous, it becomes, um, it's just not about behavior. It's, it's not useful as a, as a behavioral culture mapping tool if you're making it necessarily about, about your beliefs, in my opinion. Like, this is a very practical version of it. It's just, this is the, be the behaviors that, that characterize someone that is a fit in our team. And this is this is um, how we hire for it. Now, it may have been a bit extreme in what I said before. It can be beliefs as well. But it's important to not make it about, about your righteous beliefs or about, you know, about religion or anything like that. This is, it's, it's really about, it's beliefs in the, Insofar as as they have a behavioral a behavioral impact, I would say maybe I can, I can call it that. So everyone sits here and thanks for the, the core values, and it's so in a virtual company, what other means do we have, right? So this is the means that we have, and then we reinforce it on our quarterly meetings and our annual meetings by by, by going over some of these, and, and um, eventually we talk about compensation strategy. You know, why not have a bonus plan that's tied to core value behavior? In fact, um, there's a Another sort of meme in, uh, in entrepreneur circles, it, it's, it's sort of, well, it's not, I will not say it's a meme yet, but some of the best companies have this thing called top rating. So it's, it's a way of doing performance assessment. And the theory of top rating is that there's really only two dimensions towards assessing um, or if someone's a good fit. It's productivity and it's, it's core value fit. So it has to be both. Because if you have someone who's productive and not a fit, well, everyone's worked with human arms. And if you have someone that's a core value fit but non-productive, well, everyone's worked with fluffy people that don't get anything done. So it's really those two things. That's the only, if you only pick two dimensions, just pick only those two. And, and that's how you assess people. It's called top grade. So to reinforce it, in our annual meetings, um, we have a, an hour where we split the teams and everyone makes core value posters. So, so they make the posters and they, 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 they depict drawings of things that uh, illustrate stories of things that have come up in the last year uh, around or what they're doing in these departments to, to these values, and then, then they all present. So I mean, imagine the, what does it cost for the entire company to spend an hour like, drawing core value posters, right? But it's so important because this really makes it alive and it shows people that it matters. So why is it important? Um, well, because it, again, when you repeat, when you, we're creating a space for this to be thought of and discussed. So it's being re reinforced to people. Like we're not sitting here in this hour talking about, about you know, how we get more money, we're talking about core values, right? Yeah, it's, it's, why are the core values important? 
You said they are important. You said you give me examples of how you reinforce it. Yeah, but why are core values that important? Okay. Yeah. Are you getting there? Uh, no, it's a good question. Um, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, it's something that just sort of skim across and becomes just like an issue now. Um, a good company hires and fires based on their core values. A good team, probably as well. You know, because you've all been a team where there's one bad apple and everyone else like has a crap experience. And when that person leaves, everyone else is just like uplifted. So so how do you design bring conscious design to, to create that great experience? If you break down what 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 the core values seem to be of the team, right? Like the good core values are, are an introspective bottom up process. Like you discover your values by looking at your top performers are, what, what are they like, and, and also who your worst performers are, what, what are they like, and what kind of people not want things to be. If you're saying top performers, but how do you measure them? If you're saying that core values, yeah. then productivity goes into the top performers, but you can't just make productivity the top performers if you're saying that you're now introspecting and seeing what the top performers are and your core values, like you've got to start doing that. Yeah, well, the top rating comes much later once you've been doing core values for quite a while. So do you start with those core when we discovered this, again, we were a much a younger company, and um, and we didn't even have notions of the top rating or core productivity. We, we just looked at the people that, that seem to be the ones that we, we just get along with, right? just, just the, you know, just the beginning of it, like the best people in the company, and then the, the couple that are just the ones you struggle with, right? So the value is derived from the people. From the people, yeah. We looked at them, and we're like, well, what makes this person tick? No, you know, what is it about Kevin that, that we like so much? Oh, you know, he's so transparent. He's always talking about his status. He's always careful to make sure you know what's going on. Yeah, yeah, it's something like transparency. You know, the words exactly were, were, were changed over a few iterations. Our core values before were, were, were sentences, like you may have seen from Zappos. Like, you know, like, like if one of the core values I've heard from another company is embody the weird, or the weird is okay or something from Zappos. And that would create final level weird. Yeah, final level weirdness. So that could either also just be words, maybe word, it could be acceptance, or it could be diversity, right? So we, we, we act like that, but we, over, over time, we just but, it, but initially, it was introspective because different teams. This is another sort of like tip that I got um, that was very helpful for me. Is that at the end of the day, people need to work together. There's no one set of ultimate core values. So wh whoever is the team, whoever is the team, it needs to be make sense for them. And once those are established, then they, they tend to self-select who's hired that is a fit for that team, right or wrong. That's the values of the team. And um, are the values rigid? Can they change over time? They, they should change over time. In fact, we want to remove the value of resourcefulness because we're, we're getting that it sort of like goes without saying and, and um, almost a byproduct of, of service. So yeah, they, they, they should stay work over time. I mean, probably after, after, especially if, when you have big changes in leadership. I mean, it's sort of the heart of the company might change and, and that might impact things, right? I mean, I, the theory is that a good company, the, the values will survive any change in leadership, right? But you may have a leader that, that's just not on board maybe it's forced on the team and, and maybe things will start to change over time, right? But, but they should, yeah, they should not stone tablets. They're, um, they're supposed to reflect the team. Um, but if they're changing every quarter, then something's wrong. And those aren't, aren't your correct values. So you need to know how to hire for those values. Um, and what I've, um, I've not changed our interview process. When we do interviews, we have two, two, usually two calls. The first call is about experience. The second call is about core values. We just focus on that. And, and we do sort of the able type questions where we're trying to introspect and, and ask questions that would help them describe examples of where they would have been those values without mentioning their values. And that's really important. It's important on both ends. It's important for us to feel confident about this person as a hire. Uh, because so much of hiring is emotional, right? When someone joins and feeling that they're fit. And, but what, it's important on their side too, because when they see us telegraphing how important values are, they already come in, they're already like like pre-programmed to like to not pre-programmed, but they, they already want to work here because they see where we're from that cares about this stuff. And when they come in, they're already, when I say program, I mean they're already primed to, to, to be a better person, like to, to be more themselves, to be more, more social in that way, to, to, fit, to, to they, they feel like you're fitted faster because these things are made so apparent to them. Can you speak about the other side of that coin? The, the employee side? Yeah, like candidates that are repelled. If they're repelled, that's great. <laughs> Revulsion is great. Yeah. Can you explain that a little more? Of course it's great. So Zappos, and you know this. Yeah. If you join Zappos, they say, if you decide to quit next two weeks, we'll give you $1,000. Because it's so much better to not have someone on board that's only half committed. 
right? So, I, so if someone, I, <laughs> I'm, um, I, I'm purposely a bit, a bit fluffy with our values on the interviews, so I want people to, to get a bit too sugary taste because if they're not into that, then, then they shouldn't join, right? Because, um, uh, because I'm not, not that sugary about afterwards, right? So, so it, is that important? And I found feedback, especially when hiring really, really great, like very senior, really great people, the feedback I've gotten is that, is that this is actually one of the reasons why they wanted to join, is because we had such an emphasis on this community process. It differentiated us from other companies that were interviewing them, just asking them boring questions about the past experiences. So, so do you think the values are sufficiently disparate across different organizations? Or do you think it's just the fact that you pay so much attention to them? Is that yeah, you yeah. think everybody wants these things, right? Is it, is it just identifying good people to work in any company, it, or is it specific to? Honestly, I think it's just it's just about bringing con consciousness, conscious design to it. <coughs> what do we call it? I mean, yeah. let, let me show you another company's values, and you see that they're different words, but they some of them are, are quite the same. Um, let's look at Zappos. That's sort of the you know, poster child of this stuff.
can rational and the reason. I think once you have more than five values, I think this is this is obviously to me looking at how thing, someone just took value shift here just to like to like make make themselves right. You know, because you can't really have all that there.
who are doing something that's not related to the government's objectives. So if you want to be a fast growth organization, everyone should be aligned with, with the two or three things that really matter for the company. Because um, then you get environments where I'm sure you've all been in where you don't know why someone's doing something. Like everyone should always know why someone why they're doing something. Right? And you should all, always know why your peers are doing things. Because if you should have, if you're not, you're not aligned. Right? That why should be clear. So, so that's one thing. I'm trying to speak through a bit because I, I didn't yeah, I, I spend a lot of time on these things. So this is our objective dashboard. Um, so it's a Google spreadsheet where at the top of it is our, our top fives. Above, the, above this is also our, our annual top fives. I mentioned that we have, a, we have a alternative to the long reach plan. Um, so this, this is it. We have ownership, clearly who's accountable for our objective. And then every week we have updates by the way of red, yellow, green, or super green. We define success. So you know, <coughs> having objective is fine, but if you don't align on what success means, that, that's a recipe for failure. That's almost like that top left corner where there's, there's no structure. Um, actually, I said the bottom right corner where there's, there's no structure for this high economy. What do you want to do? It like, needs to be aligned on what success means. So, so we define what green means, what yellow means, what, what red means. Um, and then people can work towards that. And it's all one sheet, so we create transparency. Like that, that fosters purpose, because everyone can see what everyone's doing. Everyone can see you know, why these things matter, because so, hopefully they, they understand how this objective maps the company's goals. Uh, it creates autonomy, because people have to self report what they're doing every week. Um, it also creates autonomy, because we're all in it together. So that sense like we're all, we're all being measured here. Um, it's very transparent, so it's important from, from, from our core values. And it's a very simple framework. This really made a huge difference uh, in the company. I mean, imagine, uh, other than what people's normal work is, every major objective is tracked here. So Dev has some objectives too. So we use a Kanban for, for the usual churn of new features. But, but occasionally there's like a, a major feature that is tied to a business priority, so that might show up here. That's something that, that is, is so big that they're giving a lot of like wait cycles as, as requirements are being defined or as the waiting for or whatever. So they can still work up the Kanban even though the developer may have an objective that is visible at the company level. So that is always on here as well. I want everyone to sort of to have to be here because it feels good for them to be um, sort of in there.
purpose of red is not to be so on the camera. The purpose of red is to just trigger a conversation about, about you know, what we can do to get ahead and how are we going to fix this. It's very important that, that, you, that the managers come with that mindset. Um, but on the other hand, if someone's read the tea leaf, uh, Patrick Dean, he wrote this video course, Execute the Problem. He says, red, red, mean, red means that they may eventually fire themselves because they know that they're just not doable, they're not fit. So, so red, it's, again, it's self moderating from like, many different directions. And, and yellow is good. Yellow, yellow rewards progress. You know, nobody wants to be just red or, or green, right? So yellow means, well, it's a progress for me. I feel good about that. But what can I do to get to green? So there's this framework. It's so simple, but it, it, it has so many emotional components to it that, that really foster um, a culture of happiness. And finally, mastery. Uh, again, I think annual quarterly planning not only creates autonomy, Ownership, but also mastery because everyone's involved in this in this at various levels. Um, again, this creates mastery because people are ongoing improvements. Uh, metrics again for the same reason fosters mastery. Uh, I definitely Yammer. I want to show something else we built for, for mastery and for culture. It's 15.5. This is a, a startup based in San Francisco, but it's a really cool tool. Um, it's a weekly, it automates the weekly one-to-one -one report. It's very hard to have weekly one-on-one -on -one time. So this automates that. So it's a, it's a software that lets you uh, ask a set of questions at all levels of the company. And this is my personal report. So how was work last week? What am I happy about? I mean, this, this actually, also for me, it's a weekly personal retrospective. What am I happy about from last week? What challenges did I face? How am I feeling? Uh, what did I learn? Uh, what am I grateful for? Uh, you know, if my next week is successful, what would it look like? So this is, you know, what I'm, so every week, every week on Friday or Monday morning, I'm thinking about these things. So it creates mastery because I'm asking, there's a framework in which each person is thinking about these questions every single week. But it's also a framework in which they align with the manager. So in this case, uh, Roxanne is my partner. She reviewed my report. And you see that she can comment on, on, on something I said. I can reply back. Um, I can also up-level things. This one came from some reports to me. I can click on it and it appears in my reports. So managers can up-level comments made lower in the organization and I managed to see it and can put comments on it. The questions are preset and you can set the questions at company wide, group wide or individual. So you can now make it like a sort of guarded sense. Preset by you, not preset. I thought there was this would be if someone came in It's not 
one fault someone reads it because you have to explicitly mark my review, and they get an email. They don't. They're going to feel bad. Like, well, why am I reading this if you're not reviewing it? Yeah. So that's what we're talking about. You also say if your feedback's not frequent enough, right. like you just said, why don't you tell me when it mattered? Yeah. Last, you know, last week. Right. Right. So yeah. that's another common thing that happens a lot. Right. It so just makes you feel like crap. It's like how can I just I can't track in the past, right? Well, so check, check this out. It's a lot easier, right? Here's, here's the uh, My conference is a uh, platform lead. It's like, oh, we're about to launch this. I'm like, awesome. So he's getting that feedback from me, right? This is about to go up. I'm like, you know, here's some feedback. Let's get up with incrementally. Um, here's a discussion that's coming between us. Like, it's, it, if, you, if you just click review, you don't read it. I mean, you, you can use a tool and you can use it or use it well, right? So, so we're very active and we're sincere in how we use it. Uh, so, so they get a lot of feedback from us. And, and I've gotten comments that this has triggered a lot of very valuable information sharing. But again, in person is, is, is secure. But I don't know, I, I often have 10 of these for week, every week, I just don't. So this, this lets me do it quickly. You know, so it depends on the circumstances. Wait, was there a timeline in there somewhere? On that product? Uh, so you had to show the timeline was or something else. This is the editorial training timeline. This oh, the lean kit.
So this is what scoreboards allow, allow us to do. And finally, um, on, on the mastery part, so transparency, culture hacking, transparency and trust. Uh, I come up with this one, that trust without transparency is, is foolishness, but trust with transparency is empowering. So I, I'm in a virtual company, I, I basically have to trust everyone. Or I mean, if I didn't, I could be my manager, that would, that would be disastrous, it would be very unpleasant to, to, to even leave a company like that. So we can create trust, but we have structures that create transparency. Everything I've shown you, it all fits together to create an environment of trust and transparency. So Yammer, um, you know, you get the sense of buzz of what's going on. You know, you know what's happening. No one feels like they're, like they're in some kind of cubby hole. No one feels solid off because we're very transparent about everything. And I put stuff on Yammer that you know, stuff many CEOs go to, and um, and trying to create that feeling of no one's you know, no one's on their own. Thing. It's, you know, again, it's transparency from the individual to, to the manager on a weekly basis. Dashboards, scoreboards, metrics. So, so this having these kinds of structures for transparency allows for a high trust environment. So it, it's, um, or, or rather, empowers a high trust environment. And because people want to do well, I, I fundamentally believe that everybody wants to be a good person. And people want to succeed, and and, and and those are more important than money. So so we try to create an environment where. Can, can be trusted to, to, to commit to, to sign up for things and get them done and feel good about it. And we stand up, we get out of the way because there's all these transparency tools so that if someone is faltering for whatever reason, it, it's transparent and discussions should be triggered uh, that are hopefully in a power nation. Rhythms. I'm sure you guys are all very familiar with this. Stand ups. Stand ups are very useful in the business context, not just develop developers. So in, um, uh, in the Rockefeller Habits book, we talk about that you should do stand up every day. And, and in my business, because we're across so many time zones, I do them on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but different departments have different stand ups. There's an editorial department stand up, sales and marketing stand up, devs team stand up, um, and international team stand up. And so we all know what stand ups do, and I won't repeat that. But I think that's really important uh, for, for culture hacking. Um, 
um, in a virtual environment. So some of the reasons I think, especially for is because you know where, you know that everyone's going to be somewhere at a certain time. So if you need something, you know, you may pitch by a call, or maybe someone's not, not online. We, we, we have a policy with Skype that when you work on your computer, you should not Skype on uh, because it creates a sense of availability. If someone's green, then you're more likely to message them. If they're not green, they'll feel shy to call them. So we don't want to everyone. We don't want people to feel shy to contact someone if they need to, especially during work hours. So, so, so that's certainly the policy. Um, and the stand-ups sort of even further reinforce that because you, you just spoke to someone this morning and you know that they're there. You, you can trigger a call for a lock or whatever. So, Floyd, how big is your biggest time uh, difference <coughs> between <coughs> California and Romania? And what? <coughs> Romania is 10 hours. And you do daily stand-ups with, oh, you do, you do it twice a week because, is that part of it? Is that yeah. a difference? Yeah, so the uh, 8 a.m. Pacific, which is 6 p.m. Romania, was a reasonable compromise. It's from an hour before and after a standard day. And uh, yeah, that's what it says on the And being on Eastern time zone, it's very advantageous to running an international business because you're, you're sort of touching everyone's time. And, and for Asia, it's easier because it's always 12 hours. Yeah, we have to go to run business to live in California. I have to be up at like 4 a.m. or something. It's terrible. <laughs> so, other rhythms. I mean, what is a rhythm? What is a meaning? I think it, it creates a space in which certain, certain types of interactions happen. And um, so, are we deferred meetings? I, I've actually come to see that, that in order to run any kind of initiative, all you need is stand ups and a weekly meeting. And that's it. Assuming your people are good and you have cultural alignment. So like I, I could theoretically handle you know 30 projects and uh, this with 30 hours plus other you know time just for between stuff. So what we cover when 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 all the minutia of the day to day comes up on the stand up, so weekly meetings have a very fixed agenda. We start with a check in, sort of an emotional like you know what's up, you know something fun or personal. We always make time for check ins, which I think is really good. It creates a sense that we prioritize these kind of personal interactions. Uh, then we review the numbers. I showed you those metrics before. Every department should have numbers. If you're not having any kind of tracking, how do you know what you're doing? How do you know you're doing the job? So we're reviewing the numbers. The whole team reviews it together. So it, that creates ongoing mastery, ongoing learning, transparency. Um, it's meaning sure stuff. Like higher quality conversations come up and just status. Uh, and then after numbers, we look at feedback. Have we heard anything from anyone? Either it can be the company or from customers or from anyone. Like, feedback should always flow, flow upwards. You know, you know, you've all seen companies where the management idea of what's happening on the ground. So having a space where feedback is part of the agenda on a weekly basis is very important. Uh, and then actually I'm using for that too. I, I, I encourage people to use pounds feedback and, and put the raw feedback, good or bad, just put it in there. And uh, I, I tend to do that more than others. I think people are shy, but hopefully they'll, they'll get to it much. And then after feedback, then we, we just discuss a core issue, something that's blocking, or someone can propose something, just something medium term. So weekly meetings are not about status. And, and that's great because you've all been on boring, shoot, you know, shoot me dead, like status, <laughs> status calls, right? So, so I love the stand ups where status is done, and weekly meetings are about medium term and strategic. So, our weekly meetings actually have value. People want to be in those meetings because they want to know what's going on, you know, they, they want to help each other brainstorm. In an ideal setting, a weekly meeting is, is, is where someone proposes an area where they're, where they're stuck on their objective and everyone brainstorms. It doesn't always happen, it does often does turn into unblocking several things or Sometimes it turns into status on things so that are just but 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 the, the space is designed to, to be about medium term stuff. So stand ups and weekly meetings go together. And in my opinion, every department should have a weekly meeting and every project should have a weekly meeting. So and, and I'm me as CEO of a, of a medium, small medium business, I'm on almost all of them. So I am on a lot of calls here. Um so we So again, so again, even more medium term, how do we do last quarter? We 
it's pretty straightforward. One on one center should be five and an annual meeting. So we have an annual meeting. Because we're virtual, every every year we fly to some of the So we just went to Ireland a month ago. Last year we went to Spain. And the whole the whole company flies, like China, Brazil, like everybody. And um, in the annual meetings, the, the purpose of the meeting is um, actually a lot of these slides I'm showing you were from my opening presentation in the end of the meeting where, where I explained to everyone how the company's designed to, to deliver happiness to them and, uh, and in, in the context of the purpose of time and mastery. And, and um, uh, so, yeah, we, we just present to each other like what's been working well for us over the last year. So it's pretty, the end of the meeting is about best practice sharing. There's no decisions happening there. There's very little uh, brainstorming. It's just about best practice sharing and learning from each other. And then we go out and talk together and stuff. So, um, so that's, I think rhythms are so important. As I say here, you know, Aristotle, you know, it's a design, right? Bring conscious these rhythms can set you free. Um, I think rhythms create autonomy because, again, if everyone knows, everyone knows where everyone should be, that these structures and questions we cover in these meetings, they they uh, allow people to report, not report, but to reflect their progress in an open, healthy way, to get help from people, to space where they can get lost. All that speaks to autonomy and it speaks to this team building that we're in together. Floyd, yeah. uh, the annual meeting is in roughly the same time as you. Yes. What, what is that? Uh, we, we do it uh, early meeting May, sort of between the months. And it's also the six month for fiscal year, so we figure in case any decisions to be made, it's, it's a good time. Do you look forward to that? VISTA is far more important than voices. I think give people a good salary and they can create great culture. And, and things like, like an annual meeting, people will look forward to it. You know, for six, seven months, I never thought about it. Um, I gave people one year of vacation credit, like $1,000 towards your vacation next year, but you have to leave your, your own country. That's the, that's, that was the, uh, the thing, right? So people actually went and they did stuff. And, and if you may think about the, uh, I'll make up a word, the, the net emotional return.
so that there's a clear training process, just the camera I showed earlier. So before someone joins the team, they have to submit three news posts, they coach on three posts, and show that they can learn a model and that they're coachable and that they, they are aligned. And, one, and only after they pass this, they get the name and password for the CMS, and then they have complete autonomy. They can, they can post bad things, but no, this never happened. So, so, there's, so, this, so we, we, we would place the emphasis on the upfront, which a lot of great companies also place crazy emphasis on the on our interview process, right? This is a form of active interview process. If you pass this, then we know that, 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 that you're you know, that you're going to be a fit as a um, And then I mentioned the scoreboards again. This is how we reinforce the culture, perhaps for better, perhaps for worse. The editors have their own core values. These are not the same as the ones for this full time staff because again, in the context of the editorial team, they, they I guess the work they're doing. Um, yeah, I mean, we talked earlier about can core values be different. Based on what you're doing, for an editorial team, these core values are much more, much more um, important or, or relevant than like service or accountability. What does that mean when you're an editor? So, so information about this, you know, we we like to take information from the few elite and bring it to, to the many. This captures a certain energy. It's a behavior, right? It captures a certain character, personality trait that 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 is is a behavior that would suggest someone would be a great editor. And and so by knowing this behavior, we're likely to find that person or find the person. And we also have this core value for our, our QCon community, which I'll talk about just in a bit. And it's been really, it's working really well. You know, best, not first. We're not late breaking news. Uh, people should feel um, that quality matters more. And if you're known for that, it's always like a deeper analysis of things. Uh, so this this makes it okay to be best, not first, right? I don't want people to feel stressed or feel like two days behind Twitter on, on some announcement because people know that different people report it better. Um, facilitators, not leaders. You know, no one has a so it's not a soapbox for your own agenda. You know, to see yourself as a facilitator, you're helping the community see it, see its own, see its own self. It's a lens on what the community is doing, and you're just sort of being that conduit. You know, you're not trying to get. It's not a blog. We don't have blogs. We don't have columns. So really, the editors are, are like sort are like public servants in a way. They're just reporting on stuff. It's very neutral. You know, content you can trust. Are very similar to that. And collective ownership. So we want to encourage the editors to give feedback to each other, to to correct each other. That, that sometimes can be a bit fiery to a lot of like hardcore devs on the on the, on the uh, editors list, but on social skills, and sometimes it gets a bit crazy. Um, but yeah, this stuff, when we came up with, with this, we made a constitution. This was at the top of it that really changed the feeling in, in the group of editors. So that said, uh, we're always looking for more editors. If you guys are interested, in that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm like your editors. Beautiful. <laughs> you, know, it's, it's, you guys are the editors. You're the readers. So we're always looking for more interesting. Program um, committee model. Again, this is a team. Um, this is like the most micro version of, of culture hacking I've ever experienced, and it's a little most fulfilling. This is just a team of five people that plan everything at QCon and end up delivering 80 sessions, 15 tracks, 14 tutorials, keynotes, just these, from these five. And, and the way it works is we start six, about seven months ahead. My role is to be facilitator, and I create a structure in which they can play. Um, you know, we have a good structure where we brainstorm keynotes. Everyone comes to the meeting with ideas. We, um, uh, each committee member wants three tracks. So there's 15 tracks. So in each of the five on three, they can post a track or invite posts, and then post to the community, invite speakers, because those posts know more about those topic players of the track team. And um, we have weekly rhythms where we review our, our progress, we create transparency through some tools we'll show you in a moment. And, um, and I want to demo this a bit to you because it, it's the most micro version of you, but, but all the same concepts are illustrated. So on the very first day, uh, where the team gets together, I go over this document. What's our purpose as a team? You know, who do we serve? What are our core values? The core values are very similar to, to the ones I showed you. And this stuff has really come alive. Like, I use these values verbally in the meetings. For example, if, um, if someone's criticizing some other decision, I'm like, well, remember guys, collective ownership is okay. You know, let, let's take this as positive feedback. So I, I verbalize it, so I make it cool for this collective ownership. Um, the the uh, information from Robin Hoods on the ESF committee last week, Jez Humble, the last year, was on IMP. When he heard this, it was like something just went, went, woke up in him alive. He just like, there's so much energy. He brought so many ideas to the committee. And, and, he, and every time, he was like, yeah, information from Robin Hoods. Like, the words kept coming up, right? So it's, it's not like getting words on the paper. You have to make them alive. I, I acknowledge the committee members when they're exhibiting these on the, on the calls. I'm trying to reinforce this. And ultimately, it's 
five really busy people, which Peter and Amr have been on, on the screen as well. And, and it's hoping, and it's fun, right, to be on the meetings. You know, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's, it's fun. And it's, you create this, this nice feeling once a week where, um, you know, we're, we're a team that's aligned on some goals and we're delivering them really well. Um, and the collective ownership is very strong. Like, people give each other feedback. Someone can write a question to the community, like, I'm, I'm starting to find new speakers on this topic. Everyone, everyone feeds in. But it all flows from this. So this the core value stuff is so important. Uh, you know, another little, another tool I've used for that. Uh, in, in a virtual environment, the voting structure we use is great. So again, I created a structure. There's a group structure where people submit, submit talk, uh, submit talks. Key, the, the key one is actually pretty easy to look at. We have a clear um, brainstorming process where we submit talk ideas, keynote ideas. We vote here on the right hand side. You can see there's a voting matrix where, like, for each section we dot voting, people can dot vote different, different numbers. And, um, and and based on that, we just sort it, rank it, and then we start pursuing keynotes in that order. So, because I do the voting, it's never really top down. Literally, everyone has a voice. And many times I diffuse a uh, uncomfortable situation that was developing between people with different opinions. Say, okay, guys, well, let's go to a vote because there's always a silent majority that isn't talking. And you want to hear from the silent majority. And whenever someone turns out that they're in the minority who was vocal, they're always good natured about it. You know, so like these kind of uh, transparency tools, using trying to create transparency tools that get those opinions out in a, in a transparent way is, is a very good way to foster that or to create a sense of collective ownership. And, and I love this. It's so simple and it works works so well. So yeah, so that's that was the whole presentation. I showed how we culture hacking in three separate teams, um, from large to small. And uh, yeah, maybe you guys want to talk about your experiences on the committee. Like from a culture perspective, what did you see as the in terms of the culture hacking perspective? I was I was on the committee way before we started talking about culture hacking, so I'm kind of reverse engineering the, the default. Okay, we don't have to. You want to start here more?
somebody who actually saw saw it before me. Yeah, that actually reminds me of another uh, thought I got sort of a management tip. Accountability, well, the role of, um, I don't have words for this. Sometimes people have perceived that having documented accountabilities is limiting, but, but it actually is, is empowering because if, if you know what your accountability is, this is, oh, this is the idea. Uh, if you're accountable for this, then when you're going outside of that and you're helping others, you feel really good if people notice that. You, you, you know what you're, what's outside the boundary and you know when you're being helpful. And, and if you are a helpful kind of person, you can do that and you know why you're doing it. It's clear what people are receiving your help that, 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 that you're going out of, out of your way. And that's been something, um, I gotta find the right words for that. That's worth a blog on that, on that one. Because, for example, the way it came up was um, I joined someone's management team recently. And, and I think to go back to introspect as to why, why I think I did it's because he was providing value across all departments far outside of his role. And to me, that that's what I want in the executive team. People that have a broader, broader view. And I wanted to explain to other really smart performers who are not, you know, why, why they weren't. So it's, it's, you, you can be a star in your area, and that's fine. And you're very valuable. Uh, but the management team, most people that are, are cross cross cutting in their perspective, and, and they can feel good about that, and that's okay. All right, so, that's anything about it. <laughs> so, yeah, accountabilities are, are good for many reasons. <laughs> so, with what you guys are doing, though, you said that you had your own full time job, but you're also doing that. So, is this a volunteer thing that you did, or were you paid for it? Oh, I was paid for it. Okay. So, when it is volunteer, though, if you were to do it as a volunteer, you kind of take this perspective that it's not being paid for this. Well, and, and, and I are working together, we've got three or four people. You're being dictated what to do as volunteer, kind of like, whoa. Well, I, I think sometimes it's the things, you know, people are being paid like $150 an hour to do a job. Yeah. And that's not what they do. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the subteams have different values, and that's fine, right? Imagine if the U.S. were aligned on a shared state of values. No manager could have that. I mean, it's, if, they, if they mess with that, then the whole team could quit, right? It's just, once you guys get really serious about it. Like, there's, so there's a, like, I'm a software developer, and you're sort of a secondary <laughs>
idea that they're visible charts, they're, if they're immediately readable, they're on a page, that's cool. That's a good thing. So thank you. Thing where we consciously ask, what are you grateful for this week? 